Welcome to the Hello Foundation's 15-minute podcast, The Strategic Cohort, showcasing an educational administrators answering five questions related to their current position. We talk with educational leaders across settings and across states. Our objective is to share thoughts and ideas between professionals at a time when leaders can often feel isolated. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Strategic Cohort. Hi, Sharon. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with you today. I'm a student services coordinator with the Salem-Kaiser School District. We are located in um, Salem, Oregon, the capital of the state of Oregon. And our school district is made up of 42,000 students, 67 schools, and many more programs as well. So that's a little bit about Salem-Kaiser. Wow, that's really impressive. How long have you been in that role? This is my fifth year. Um, Prior to that, I worked in the Oregon Department of Education from 2002 to 2010. Wow, that is fantastic. So in this current role with Salem-Kaiser, what's the greatest challenge that you face? I would say that um, one of the big responsibilities of being a manager in the times that we find ourselves in now is to always bring the people that we work with back to the question of why we do what we do. Um, There have been significant budget cuts. There's additional pressure on all positions to perform at higher levels. The resources are stretched. We have more and more complex kids coming in. And what I find is that um, most everybody that I work with went into this field with with a big heart to make a difference in the lives of kids with disabilities and their families. And to to make a living doing that as well, of course. But I think along the way, for all the reasons that I mentioned a little bit earlier, sometimes people lose their way in remembering what it is that we are doing, what a high calling it is, an important calling it is, to make sure that kids with disabilities have the same opportunities as their non-disabled peers, that they have an opportunity to maximize their potential as a human being and their potential educationally. And um, there are sometimes subtle ways that that's done, and sometimes it has to be pretty direct, but just always holding up to people just how important and, if you will, sacred this work is that we do. And when people find their way back to that, um, things go much better. Oh, isn't that the truth? Has that been a similar challenge you think uh, you've faced in other roles, or is this unique to the current hat you wear? Well, I I started my career working with kids with disabilities and their families back in 1983. I've run nonprofit organizations in several states, and I was an association executive and a lobbyist in two states, but all of it involved kids and adults with disabilities and their families. And I do think um, I've been blessed to meet some exceptional people who work in this field along the way, but we all get a little discouraged at times because of all the challenges. We just always have to keep our eye um, on what's important and why we do what we do. And Sharon, I believe you were at an event I was at recently where the keynoter said, Once we understand the why of things, the how becomes easier. And that's really what our job is as managers, to hold the why up so that we can get to the how. Oh, boy, isn't that the truth? Some people get so lost in the how. And it's like, let's kind of backtrack or hold the bigger picture up. Share a success that you've had at some point in school administration. Well, I guess I'll talk a little bit about my work at Salem-Kaiser right now. There are two things that I feel particularly proud of right now, um, which, of course, are not all me. They're great people that I work with as well. But the first would be I am the Section 504 coordinator for Salem-Kaiser School District. And this is our fifth year um, under my supervision of that program. And we've been very fortunate that we've not had a single complaint filed by a parent against our school district related to an evaluation or child find or a 504 plan as written. Wow. And so really and truthfully, I supervise the program. I train the counselors, but they do the work at the building level and they do it very well. And we're very proud of that fact in our district. 
And then I guess I would say the second part is, as you know, um, working with SLPs, they're some of the brightest and most talented people that we're ever going to work with. But they, it's the issue of workload. It's very, very sensitive to them. And one of the concepts that I had since um, having supervision of that group of folks is to have them elect some of their peers to work with me to look at the data and to look at assignments and workload throughout the district. And while it's not a, a perfect science and while not everyone is always happy about it, I think we've found a place where more and more people are finding the assignment of work is fairer than it's ever been. And um, using their own peers to help guide me, as I'm not an SLP myself, I think has been a very successful thing. What a great way to generate buy-in, though. That's fantastic. Uh, what advice would you share with a new school administrator? That's a really good question, Sharon. Um, I guess I would, two things, I guess I would, I would say. We use big words in this day and age as managers. We talk about how all means all. Every kid is important. But many of our administrators are not well equipped for working with kids who have different abilities. So I, I'm talking about kids, uh, ELL challenges, kids with disabilities. And also, sometimes people in special education don't know enough about the broader educational enterprise that they are part of. And so for both general ed and special ed administrators, my my counsel would be make sure that you spend a lot of time studying about the entire educational enterprise uh, so that you understand it all and you're equipped to work with all kids of differing abilities. I think the second part I would tell people would be we have to find a balance between instructional leadership and being a good manager. Uh, we have a lot of people now in our schools who have a strong background in instruction and we do need good instructional leaders but they also need to be people who have good community relations skills good skills with parents people who can manage a budget um, handle situations of great conflict uh, be able to generate new resources and so forth so um and people, of course, who come in from a managerial background who don't have much of an instructional background have to hone their skills in that area. So I guess I would say, as a new administrator, try to find the balance and read and take classes and do professional development that help you be equipped to be both a very strong instructional leader and an exceptionally good manager. Oh. Eric, that oh, that is such a perfect answer. It's one of the most perfect answers I've heard. But it almost at the same time sounds really hard. I mean, <laughs> how do you find that balance with instruction and management? I mean, that is, oh, it's never ending, I imagine. Well, it is tough, Sharon. You know, speaking for myself, I've not been a teacher in the K-12 enterprise. Um, I've I've been instructor at the college level, but never in K-12. So I have to spend a lot of time um, studying, reading up, and taking classes on instructional things, spending time with people who, who are exceptionally strong in that area, because I owe that to the people I supervise and to the kids we serve if I'm going to be balanced in my managerial skills. Wow. Well, I give you a lot of credit. I do... I can testify, though, to what you say. Some of the best reading recommendations I've gotten haven't been from my peer group, but have been from educational leaders. They seem to be, at least the good ones, are always, you know, scouting and reading and exploring to on ways to improve. Well, we all say that we're lifelong learners, and that it's really the truth. Uh, <laughs> it is. It this is. is an important field and a big field, and, and we are constantly learning. Yeah. Well, in your opinion, what trends are currently, as can, talking about learning and ongoing learning, what trends currently are going to impact education in the future that you're seeing right now? Oh, goodness. We could talk about that for a long time. Um, I'll try my best to be succinct here, but I, when I think about that, I think about a variety of things. First of all, the government. 
we just had elections. What will happen with the new people who are leading our country and our state now? You know, uh, resources are not everything. You can do a lot of good things with limited resources, but they are important. And just as you look to our federal funding, for example, we're down 5% in Individuals with Disabilities Education Act funding since 2011. And the original intent of IDEA was to fund special education excess costs uh, or 40% of the excess costs of special education. And we're now at 14.9%, which is the lowest point we've been at since 2001. Wow. So what will our newly elected leaders, um, how will they prioritize education as a whole and kids with disabilities within that budget? That's one trend. Another would be where does special education fit in within the broader reform of Common Core, uh, smarter balanced assessments? We're, we're very much in it now. There was a time where we were separated out from some of these greater initiatives. We're deep into them now. So um, how is that going to turn out? Um, there's higher expectations of higher performance and outcomes for kids with special education programs, which I applaud and which we need, but it also puts additional pressure on our staff. And of course, integrated education and universal design are here and they're very real and school districts are struggling with how to do that properly. And then when you look at education trends broadly, a huge emphasis now on early childhood how can we uh, meet kids early in their life uh, with the needs that they have and minimize the deficits that they might have moving forward with early childhood interventions? Assistive technology is huge. We're finding whether it's a cochlear implant or new software applications that we use with iPads or what have you, uh, many kids can be liberated from some of the challenges they face through these new developments. A huge issue again is shortage of teachers. I think I heard last week that we have 50% less people who have made application to be a teacher in Oregon schools than was true five years ago. Oh, wow. And, you know, uh, I know here in Salem Kaiser, we're always looking for good teachers and we have a shortage uh, right now. And, and then teacher evaluation. I think um, expectations of teachers for their performance is very good, but at the same time, it's putting enormous pressure on teachers. How is this going to turn out? How is it all going to work out? Yeah, I feel like we have a crescendo of mandates trying to juggle everything from student performance to teacher performance. And <laughs> it's I, I think it's all well intended. And my hope is that somewhere in the middle we'll find a healthy balance, but it's not going to happen in the next year or two. Absolutely. And and as you know, um, with a lot of these mandates, not very much money or no money sometimes comes with them. And uh, that's a real challenge. So we our hope where newly elected people will uh, be aware of that and step up and help in that regard. Okay, that that is such a good point. I think we would all agree on. But my last question to kind of round out our time together is how, on a little lighter note, how are students different today than when you were in school? You know what? I don't know that at their core kids are really that different. I just think all the circumstances around them are significantly different. Um, back when we were in school, Sharon, I, I think you'd probably agree things were a lot less complicated. Oh, yeah. Um, today, what kids are facing, they're being pulled in multiple directions by video games, by um, media, by Facebook, what have you. The pressure to past tests, I think, is greater than it was back when we were in school. There's multiple, multiple pressures on kids and many complexities facing them in their life. And then I think another thing that's true is back when I was in school, there was never any question I was going to go to college and a, a very clear understanding from my parents that if I did that, it would open doors to me more than if I chose not to go to college. But today, Many kids look at college and they, they know it's important, but they also wonder, are there going to be jobs out there? If I spend all of this money going to college and put all this effort in, 
and I see the unemployment rates and the lack of jobs out there uh, for me in, in some fields, is this something I want to do? That's another pressure and challenge for kids today. Yeah. On, on that note, I marvel how many kids are very comfortable, it seems, staying at home much longer. I mean, when I, I couldn't wait to run away from home as an adult, you know, with my quotey fingers in the air. But nowadays, there's a sense because of school or expense or difficulty obtaining jobs. Um, I think we do see kids staying kids and at home with families a little longer. I agree with you. I have two girls that are now 25 and 22, and they're great kids, but I know their dependency on me as a parent is is much greater than mine was upon my parents when I was their age, and this is the way it is with most of their peers. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but fortunately, you're probably an awesome dad because you're such a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sharon. You're very kind. I have no I, I doubt. Hope, I hope my girls would say I do okay, but I'm sure there's lots of improvement to be made as well. <laughs> it's that lifelong learning. We yes, never get is. to escape it, no matter where we're at. Absolutely. Well, Eric, I really appreciate your time today. So thank you so much. And I definitely know people will be tuning in to listen to these words of wisdom. Sharon, thank you very much. And uh, just a shout out to the Hello Foundation and what an exceptional job you do with the organization and uh, the talented people that work in our school districts. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. It's wonderful to partner with, you know, administrators who share our values of quality service to kids. Thank you, Sharon. Many thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Strategic Cohort. We thank all of our administrator partners for practicing quality and putting kids first. We are always seeking administrators interested in answering our five questions for this podcast. If you would like to be a part of the strategic cohort, please contact us at Sharon.Soliday at the hello foundation.com. We always provide participating administrators a copy of the recording to share on their own LinkedIn profile.